Someone told me in the comment section that I blast liberals too much. I understand the sentiment. So let me begin by apologizing to the liberal community. It does not matter. It really does not matter if you are liberal or you're normal. It does not matter. And seriously, when I closely examined, I did realize that blame it on the liberals seems to be the favorite pastime of human beings. It seems anything goes wrong in the world, human beings have the tendency to blame the liberals. Even in India, this trend has caught on. We have stopped using cuss words. We simply say, this wasn't our fault, it's the liberals. Liberals espouse all goody goody things. Environment activism, diversity, gender sensitivity, body positivity, multiculturalism, hatred for mathematics. One important thing to note is that when I say liberals here on TFI Global, that is the international offshoot of TFI Media Group, I mean white liberals because no other race can claim to be liberal. No other race. All other races are supposed to be cared for and apologized to by white liberals. Take this study as an example. There is a book club with the two possible club secretaries, Emily and Lakisha. Now, Emily is stereotypically associated with white people and Lakisha with black people. The language that liberals and conservatives use to converse with the secretary differs drastically. When describing the tone of a book, a liberal writing to Emily could use terms like melancholy or euphoric, but while writing to Lakisha, they might use the more straightforward terms like sad or happy. The reason is that liberals sympathetically understand that people of color do not possess a rich vocabulary. However, a conservative white person can say sad or melancholy, or gloomy, grim, mournful, pensive, somber, sorrowful, trite, wistful, blue, down, downbeat, downcast, low, moody, dejected, despondent, destroyed, disconsolate, dismal, dispirited, doleful, dolorous, basically anything that first comes to their mind. Because white conservatives are not sympathetic. It's the liberals' sympathy for the downtrodden and downcast, that is, anyone except them and, of course, the conservatives, that gets them a lot of flack. But like I said, they aren't bad per se. In this episode of the Atul Mishra Show, I will show you the true sympathetic side of liberals and force you all to apologize to liberals if you have been unkind to them in any way. So without further ado, let me welcome you to the Atul Mishra show, part podcast and part sermon. You may or may not like the content, but there is no chance in hell that you won't like me. Music, please. <laughs> Let me dissect a very important aspect of liberalism, their obsession with names. Here is an example. Once upon a time in the land of calm Punjabis and peaceful Muslims, no, 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 not India. I'm talking about the great white north. I'm talking about Canada. A significant shift occurred. The North York Women Teachers Association of Toronto, Ontario, Canada published a pamphlet for teachers called Non-Violent Language, which contained a list of violent or militaristic phrases and suggested alternatives. Here are some of the examples. Kill two birds with one stone. Get two for the price of one. There's more than one way to skin a cat. There are different ways to solve a problem. Take a stab at it. Go for it. Get away with murder. 
Avoid consequences. It's an uphill battle. It's next to impossible. You are dead meat. You are in serious trouble. Kick it around. Consider the options. That's a low blow. That's outside the rules. Hit them where it hurts. Find their vulnerability. Crush the party. Show up anyway. Shoot yourself in the foot. Undermine your own position. Isn't that great? Message conveyed without being too violent like those gun-touting conservatives like to be. I think this trend was started by Al Pacino in Scarface when he brandished a big machine gun, but said, Say hello to my little friend. It wasn't little. It wasn't a friend. And saying hello to a dangerous gun isn't an option. But Al Pacino, a die-hard liberal, kept it respectful even in the face of mindless violence, a masterpiece. And then, back in 2009, New York Transit Authority officials admitted to hiring convicted criminals, but preferred to refer to them in the more politically correct terminology of criminally challenged, legally impaired, or people of alternative conviction status. Again, again, using Al Pacino's iconic Tony Montana from Scarface as an example, in the eyes of the NYTA officials, he would have been designated as violently disillusioned or person of alternative professional status. Dr. Hannibal Lecter would have been a person of unconventional culinary preference. And Donald Trump would be, Donald Trump would be what? He'd be a white supremacist. That's it. Huh. It's the illustrious work of the predecessors that has led to Trudeau branding manhole as maintenance holes, mankind as people kind, and black folks as people of color which, scientifically speaking, is not even accurate. Black is not a color. Even white is not a color. Black is an effect that is caused when every color of the visible spectrum of light is absorbed. And white is an effect that is caused when every color of the visible spectrum of light is simply reflected. So scientifically speaking, both blacks and whites are <laughs> people of no color. But why digress for the sake of this extremely stupid and something as trivial as science? Now that the name part is done and I have already proven the intellectual superiority of liberals over humans, let's dive straight to environment activism. Hardcore conservatives should skip this part because I am going to drop one truth bomb after the other. One fine day in April 2007, Cheryl Crow of USA Today clearly outlined her view on environmentalism. She, with the finesse of a seasoned senator and the intellect of a USA Today journalist, said, I propose a limitation be put on how many squares of toilet paper can be used in any one sitting. Now, I don't want to rob any law-abiding American of his or her God-given rights, but I think we are an industrious enough people that we can make it work with one, only one square per restroom visit. Except, of course, those... <laughs> Pesky occasions where two to three could be required. That's right. One tissue paper to wipe your arse. Some remnants won't hurt, except your underpants, maybe. You may even become a cultured person by growing a culture of bacteria around your rare orifice. She was truly ahead of her time. That was the kind of activism that led to greater thunbirds. Those who live in big mansions, who take private jets to world economic events and Tell us, how dare you? Well, as an Indian, I can dare because I don't use toilet paper. I use water. But I do see her point. A John Travolta who thinks global warming is eating the world and then he coolly moves to his private airport with two active runways for his 
collection of private jets. And when he is not flying around, he drives around on his very, very eco-friendly luxury cars like the 14 MPG Rolls-Royce Phantom and Jaguar XG6 or International Climate Leadership Awardee Arnold Schwarzenegger, who owns a Gulfstream 3 jet and very fuel-efficient cars like a Bugatti, Veyron Vitesse, and a military-grade Hummer H1. The list is endless, with A-listers like Harrison Ford, the saintly Leonardo DiCaprio, and James Cameron. I'm sure with superlative efforts from these very, very eminent liberals and the one square per restroom visit, we can make Earth a better place. Now, conservatives who are seething in rage, and I know you are seething in rage, you go ride your wasteful horses and, and keep growing your crops. You won't get any of it. All right, environment is out and I have already made my case super strong. So let's move to the next part. Die Vol City. The United States of America is the champion of this branch of liberalism. One of their presidents, and in fact, their current vice president is a product of what? Oh, okay, this line was edited out. Sorry, guys. I write stuff that editors always chop off. I've been told that uh, the eminent intellectuals that I was talking about got their jobs because of their talent and qualification and experience and blah, blah, blah. Okay. Okay, I will maintain my storytelling streak as I have in the previous spots. In striving for diversity in the United States of Amazement, a freelance artist who illustrated books for kids received 10 pages of single space instructions setting forth multicultural guidelines. This was 2010. Here is a description of one of the pictures based on the instructions. The hero is a Hispanic boy. There is a set of African-American twins. One girl, one boy. An overweight Asian boy. A Native American girl. And a Caucasian girl born with congenital malformation. That gave her only three fingers on one hand. To eliminate stereotype, the Hispanic boy's parents had to be white collar workers and eat non-Hispanic food like spaghetti and meatballs and a salad. And just to round things out, the artist was instructed to draw in the background a senior citizen. That was 13 years back. 13 years back. Imagine when call for diversity was still in its diapers. Now, of course, diversity has turned into a beautiful half Asian, half Latino teen thing with an afro for a haircut. It has one eye, thinning hairline, and an overgrown middle finger. I'm calling it it because it prefers to call itself it. Look at how beautifully diverse movies and TV series we are getting these days. Queen Charlotte is black in TV series Bridgerton. Cleopatra is black in Netflix's docudrama Queen Cleopatra. We're getting a bunch of LGBTQIA plus superheroes. Look at how beautiful the Democratic Party looks with the likes of Rashida Taleb openly supporting, uh, what to call them, terroristically challenged folks. And the ever so graceful Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez promoting documentarily challenged people to cross the border and jump straight into the United States of amusement. Look at the United Kingdom. I don't see a United Kingdom. I see. Middle Eastern kingdom of sorts? Where is the real UK these days? I don't know. I hope it is clear to all bigots in the world how beautiful the world looks with a more than healthy dollop of diversity. Better movies, better government, the works. Let us now focus our attention to one field where liberals completely outshine the stupid conservatives, and that's showing love to even those who never voted for them. Look at what this beautiful, beautiful beast of a man, Michael Moore, said in 2001. 
That was the year when terroristically and possibly flightily misguided minority, of course, mistakenly rammed into the World Trade Centers with their jets. Michael Moore said, and I quote, Many families have been devastated tonight. This is just not right. They did not deserve to die. If someone did this to get back at Bush, then they did so by killing thousands of people who did not vote for him. Boston, New York, D.C. and the Plains, destination of California. These were the places that voted against Bush. Yes, yes and yes. Why kill those who keep the ugly conservatives out? There were so many places they could have chosen. You can almost feel Michael Moore's humanity inside your heart. Not the conservatives, they do not have heart. And then there was Barack Obama, that beautiful man who stated, oh, it's not surprising. Then they get bitter. They cling to guns or religion or antipathy to people who aren't like them or anti-immigrant sentiment or anti-trade sentiment as a way to explain their frustrations. Oh, and how right Barack Obama was. Blue-collar workers are loathsome, village idiots, not falling for liberalism. And Joe Biden has only taken his previous boss's work to a whole new level. Remember when he said, if, if, you, if you're black and, and not voting for Democrats, then you, you aren't black. Simple, your vote decides your race and your race decides your vote. That's how simple the world is and not as complicated as conservatives make it sound like. What's on the menu is love for the minority. Because if you love your family, country and God, you are an unfeeling stone. If you accept and appreciate minorities, you are a human being. But if you give every last penny of your savings, your home, your security, your life, for the betterment of minorities, you, my friend, are a hero. Conservatives fare very badly here, but liberals shine like Kohino diamond that the UK stole from India. Too bad immigrants stole UK from the UK. Anyway, understand the liberal love for minority with this example. A concerned parent noticed several basic errors, including an incorrect explanation for gravity in his daughter's high school science textbook. It formed the publisher and hoped it would correct the errors in the next print. But publisher wrote to the father and explained that they were aware of the errors. But they were necessary evils to simplify the mathematics for enriched, average and remedial students alike. That's absolutely fucking lutely right. It is incorrect to assume that everyone was born in the same situation and hence gravity magnetism, thermodynamics, electricity, mechanics, calculus, every basic rule of basic science, basic physics are different for different people. I'm sure conservatives will think of me as a fool, but I would rather die a fool than an unfeeling stone. If you're still not sold, then let me tell you another story that will make clear how seriously liberals take minority love. The very liberal Miami-Dade County School Board regretfully informed a computer consulting firm that it was ineligible as a vendor because the business was not minority-owned. A business, as per their rules, can qualify as minority-owned only if one minority group has the controlling share, that is at least 51% of its assets. The company in question, Data Industries, was owned as a 50-50 partnership by two friends, Charles Duval, who was an African-American man, 
and Paul Reifelsen, a Hispanic man. A spokesman for the school board said that he sympathized with data industries but insisted that a rule is a rule. And our rule says that there must be 51% ownership by one principal minority group. He went on to justify the decision by saying, we are just trying to preserve the integrity of the system. Explaining that the county wants a clear-cut owner to avoid having minority businesses sell out to white males. Got it, you conservative dolts. That's how you uphold the law. Now let us move to the culture of meritocracy that conservatives so proudly chair. Sorry, sirs. You have misled the nation for so long. What do you mean a person with an engineering degree and with outstanding records should be able to work in a high-worth engineering project? Can degrees stop? Anyone can print anything on a piece of paper. But what does it imply? Nothing. Big nothing. Take the Avery Conley School in Illinois that was banned for two years from the state science fair. No, school was not caught in any scandal or cheating. No, the students were very nice. They were not engaging in any illegal activities. They were barred from the fair because they had won the championship four years in a row. And officials wanted to give other schools a chance to win the title for a change. Change is what matters. Merit is racist and might I say hateful. Talking about the US, one of their presidents and in fact even current vice president is not a product of meritocracy but or no. Oh, okay, this was the same, same line, same line. I forgot for a moment that this was the same line that I earlier said and was read it out. Both the eminent intellectuals were of course, uh, very talented, and that's why they got their job. Okay, yeah, sure. I can uh, only imagine how anguished uh, the conservative viewers of this channel must be feeling now that I have so beautifully put my words across. Now let me come to the truth and lie binary. Conservatives, in their quest for world dominance, divided the world in a truth and lie binary. The facts considered true were respected and poor lies never got the love they rightfully deserve. When a liberal lies to the American public, he is in effect saying, you are too stupid to know what is good for you. I will say anything I need to say to convince you my way is the right way. I have two Barack Obama anecdotes to prove my point. In a public address, the handsome hero of a president said, there was something stirring across the country because of what happened in Selma, Alabama. Because some folks are willing to march across a bridge. So they got together and Barack Obama Jr. was born. Yes, of course. Barack Obama's birth was a direct result of the civil rights movement. Obama was born in 1961. The Selma March took place in 1965. But it is the thought that matters. End of the discussion. Then Barack Obama, during a campaign stop in Oregon, May 9, 2008, said, Well, was counted. Over the last 15 months, we have traveled to every corner of the United States. I've been in 57 states. I think one left to go. Alaska and Hawaii. I was not allowed to go to, even though I really wanted to. But my staff would not justify it. You say America has 50 states. Obama says there are 57 plus 2 or 57 plus 1. Truth alone cannot decide the case and lie cannot be allowed to die in disgrace. 
The point is that the fellow traveled and again, it is the thought that matters. End of the discussion. If this doesn't convince you that a lie is nobler than truth, then I do not know what will. I now come to my second last point. The art of being and saying stupid. Something conservatives cannot get their heads around. Barack Obama, my favorite American president till date, at Las Cruces, New Mexico, on May 26, 2008, stated, On this Memorial Day, as our nation honors its unbroken line of fallen heroes, and I see many of them in the audience here today, her sense of patriotism is particularly strong. Donald Trump, despite being so toxically patriotic, was never able to see dead soldiers attending any Memorial Day ever. Nor did Bush, Reagan, or anyone. But Obama could, because he understood and mastered the science of being stupid. In 2004, there was supposed to be a casting for votes in the new Mexico House of Representatives. The House was having a special Friday evening session on health insurance taxation and Democratic leaders needed one of their members. Representative Bengi Regensburg, who wasn't present at the time to cast an emergency vote. But they got him. They got bad press, all right, and looked very stupid on TV, but they finished an important job. Want to know how the situation played out on TV? I will maintain a straight face. According to a February 16, 2004 report on Albuquerque TV station KQRE, the Democrats sent state police to retrieve Regensburg from the Santa Fe Motel, where he was headquartered during the session. Troopers managed to bring Regensburg to the capital after reportedly having had to subdue and handcuff the naked, combative and likely intoxicated representative. And then there is Joe Biden who told Missouri State Senator Chuck Graham in 2008 at a political gathering, stand up Chuck, let him see ya. Chuck couldn't get up because he was wheelchair ridden. But but then that's the whole point. Look stupid. The world will fall at your feet. I can almost hear conservatives guffawing. Laugh. Laugh some more. But you will never master the art or the science of being stupid. And liberals, you have my full support. And my apologies because... Before writing this gem of a script, even I was a part of that guffawing crowd. Like an expert magician, I saved the prestige for the last. Racism is not bad per se, but conservative racism is of very low quality, 240p, and harmful. Liberal racism is both top-notch and beneficial for society. Here is a good example. According to an article in the Chicago Sun-Times, a University of Pennsylvania student group that was called White Women Against Racism excluded a black woman who expressed an interest in joining the group. A spokesperson for the group explained that whites have to meet among fellow whites to understand why they so often exclude blacks. Racism is a white problem. Yeah, and we have a responsibility as white women in particular to do what we can to eradicate racism. That's the only way to do it. Classy, subtle and positive. And then Joe Biden introduced Barack Obama to the world at large as, I mean, you got the first mainstream African-American who is articulate and bright and clean and a nice looking guy. I mean, that's a storybook, man. Yeah, it's a bit condescending, you might say, but it's Joe Biden. And what might sound condescending to you is actually a lesson in empowerment. Donald Trump cannot pull this off. 
he will be declared a clan member because he cannot do condescension as good as Joe Biden. So they all see how did the impossible became possible. Before watching this video, you thought liberals are stupid. You still do. But I changed the meaning of stupidity. You thought the diversity agenda was, well, borderline madness. You still think so. But now I have added an additional perspective of seeing differently abled so many. That changes everything. You consider meritocracy everything. You still do. But now you do see the invalidity of degrees in modern day America. Likewise, you have new perspectives of minority love, of liberalism, of liberal racism, of stupidity for the greater good and other noble concepts. I hope you feel as guilty as me. And if you do, close your eyes, fold your hands and just say, I'm sorry, liberals. I really am. Letters to the liberals, may you get more diverse, more racist more stupid. And this brings me to the end of this brilliant, brilliant, brilliant episode. Please hit like if you like the content. Please shower your love in comment section. Ask your friends to come subscribe to the channel because saying sorry to liberals is a fundamental duty of every earthling who misunderstood them. Thank you. Take care. And I love you.